we heard about it, time seemed to stop. A newborn baby kidnapped from the hospital, every minute feeling like a lifetime for his frightened family. Somebody got my baby, please, God, please, please hire my grandson. We were with police tracking down every lead. And there when they put someone in cuffs. Right now, the search for baby Bryce. Breaking news coverage starts right now. Live, local, late breaking. Channel 11 News starts with breaking news. Somebody got my grandson. Please return my baby. God, please. A tearful and desperate plea after a newborn baby is taken right from the hospital by a stranger wearing hospital scrubs. We've been breaking into programming all afternoon. And we are certainly hoping that our coverage will help reunite the family with missing Bryce Coleman. We have several reporters working right yeah, now to bring it. you all of the angles in this story. Four of them will be live in the next few minutes. But we begin tonight with Vince Sims, our first reporter at McGee. Vince? Yes, we've been here live at McGee since this all went out. And when we first got here, we made it here and we saw police still swarming here to McGee Women's Hospital with their sirens and lights going as they've been searching for this missing three day old little baby. Take a look. This is the picture. This is the baby they want you to see. This is a picture I was able to talk with his grandmother and she told me that his name is Bryce Coleman. That is the name of the little three day old little baby boy. Major breaking news in Pittsburgh, a hospital shooting. We have several people shot inside Western Psych. Lives have been lost. Police have surrounded buildings in Oakland. Schools and colleges nearby are under lockdown. A very scary situation. We're talking to people caught in the middle of it all. Breaking news coverage you can count on right now at 5. Live, local, late breaking. Channel 11 News starts with breaking news. Oakland under siege, a gunman opened fire inside Western Psych this afternoon. A police officer is among the wounded this evening. Police now believe there was just one single gunman. And now that suspect is dead. Here's the very latest for you. At least nine people shot. Two of them are dead including the suspect. An officer was heard grazed by a bullet. Western Psych, the nearby University of Pittsburgh and other schools are under lockdown or were under lockdown. This all began inside Western Psych in Oakland and it has blocked off nearby streets and created terror for people working and living in that area. We have several reporters who have been breaking into programming with us all day, giving you the very latest. We begin our coverage with Rick Earl, who's live right at the scene there, Rick. Well, Peggy, it was a very tense situation here earlier today. When I arrived on the scene, police officers were telling us to get back, to stay back. They suspected there might be another shooter on the loose. Turns out there was not. There was only one shooter involved here at this point, and that shooter is now dead. Of course, a total of nine people shot, seven people uh, wounded and are now being treated at Presbyterian Hospital. Two people are dead. Two of the nine are dead, including the shooter. We don't know much about the other person who was shot and killed. We are working to learn details about that. It is a very active scene here now. Uh, there are police surrounding this entire area. You're looking at some video that we shot earlier today. It was a normal morning in a quiet town. But in an instant, the sense of security we all take for granted was taken away. A masked man came in and just started shooting. Well, I heard like seven loud booms. She heard gunshots and she heard screams on the intercom. I saw some of the bullets going past the hall that I was right next to. I saw three injured children. Everybody was like crying. One of them had was very bloody, had a very bloody face, and then two other ones were carried out. Our team coverage will take you through what happened in that Connecticut elementary school. We'll also try to answer the important questions about school security, how to talk to our kids, and if we can ever prevent something like this. A difficult day in America as we try to understand the school shooting. But it was when they told the parents, all these parents were waiting for their children to come out. They thought that they were, you know, still alive. And there's 20 parents that were just told that their children are dead. It was awful. Live, local, late breaking. Channel 11 News starts with breaking news. The sun has set on Newton, Connecticut. A day this town and none of us will ever forget. It's always difficult when you deal with tragedies involving children. And today this story is going beyond what's happening in Connecticut. 
Peggy, please give us the latest on the headlines. Yeah, Darius, you'd never think something like this could happen in a school, but once again, that is the sad reality. 28 people are dead, 27 of them at the school, 20 of those our children. The gunman is also dead. So too is his mother believed to be a teacher there. And these are young kids. Most of the victims were in a kindergarten class. The scene of this tragedy is Newtown, Connecticut. And Sandy Hook Elementary School is about to join the likes of other schools like Columbine and Virginia Tech. We have Team 11 coverage for you as we try to understand how this occurred and what is being done to prevent something similar happening in our schools. We begin with Rick Earl and the latest details coming out of Connecticut. Rick. Yeah, Peggy, just minutes ago, the Associated Press identified the shooter as 20 year old Adam Lanza. Reports now indicate he may have had some mental health issues. His mother was a kindergarten teacher at that elementary school. She was killed in the shooting along with 20 young students. And tonight the question is why? Why would anyone target innocent children? Dramatic images as police surround the building behind the elementary school searching for the shooter. Crying school children holding hands are quickly escorted out by police. Breaking news. Good evening, everyone. Breaking news. A verdict in the Jerry Sandusky trial sex abuse case. Jerry Sandusky moments ago arrived at the courthouse to face the jury that will decide if he goes to jail. I'm Darius Chisholm. Thanks for being with us tonight. Jerry Sandusky is learning his verdict right now. The jury finished two long days of deliberations about a half hour ago before reaching a decision tonight. Channel 11's Courtney Brennan joins us live outside of the courthouse. So Courtney, what's happening now? Well, Darius, this is the moment we have all been waiting for. The entire nation is watching after more than 12 hours of deliberations today and eight and a half hours of deliberations yesterday. We finally have a verdict in the Jerry Sandusky case. Everyone wants to know what did the jury decide? Did, did they decide to go with a prosecution who categorized Jerry Sandusky as a serial predatory pedophile who, who preyed on children that he came into contact with through his second mile charity? Or will the jury decide with Jerry Sandusky's defense attorney, Joe Amendola, who categorized uh, Jerry Sandusky as just a big kid who wanted to help other kids and that these alleged victims are in a conspiracy together and they are out to get Jerry Sandusky and they are out to get his money. We will find that out shortly. The, the verdict could actually uh, be read right now in the courtroom. We will not find out what that verdict is until the entire verdict is read uh, and the judge adjourns court for the evening. Now Sandusky faces 48 counts of child sexual abuse and 26 of those are felonies. 22 are misdemeanors. If Jerry Sandusky is convicted on only a few of those felonies, he could spend the rest of his life in prison because many of those felonies carry mandatory prison sentences of 10 to 20 years. And we all know that Sandusky is uh, 68 years old, so he could absolutely spend the rest of his life in prison. The most serious charges Jerry Sandusky faces are involuntary deviant sexual intercourse, unlawful contact with a minor, aggravated indecent assault, and endangering the welfare of a child. Here it is. Here it is. 45? 45 counts guilty. 40, 45 counts? 45 counts, only two not guilty. Okay. Jerry Sandusky was found guilty on 45 counts. 45 counts he was found guilty, only two not guilty counts of indecent assault. Uh, Renee Kaminsky, who was in the courtroom, uh, says Jerry was stunned. 45 counts. Jerry Sandusky was found guilty on 45 counts. Only two counts he was found not guilty on. For those of you all joining us here on Channel 11 News, as we just said, we've learned that there has been obviously a verdict in this case against Jerry Sandusky. Guilty on 45 counts. Two not guilty of the counts that he faced uh, in total. Joined now with uh, Blaine Jones. He is our legal expert. You've been watching this case with us for some time. This came relatively quickly. Two days of deliberations. We got the word that the jury had reached a verdict probably about a half hour ago and now these counts, 45 of them found not guilty. Darius, it came quickly. However, it is not a shock. I predicted that it would come by Friday. I thought it would come by this weekend. Reason being, the, w the evidence was simply overwhelming against Mr. Sandusky. I thought that the defense, unfortunately, did not come out aggressive. If you have a case and the evidence is overwhelming against your client, you come out like Mike Tyson. You come out swinging, you come out with haymakers. In my opinion, they came out tentative. They threw pity pat jabs, and as a result, Mr. Sandusky gets knocked out. This is Channel 11 News, 11 at 11. News coverage you can count on.
A major gas line explosion to blame for this wall of flames. This was a scene just hours ago near Charleston, West Virginia. And now to the aftermath. At least four homes destroyed and five others damaged. You can see the burnt ground as investigators try and figure out what went wrong. At one point, the flame shot 50 to 75 feet high. Just an amazing sight. As soon as we got word of the explosion, we sent Channel 11's Julie Fine and her photographer in Chopper 11. They rushed to the scene there in Sissonville, West Virginia, near Charleston. She's there tonight talking to residents and investigators about this massive explosion. Right now we're at the mobile command site. This is the closest we could get to that gas explosion, but take a look right there behind me. That smoke right there is from a house that was ruined in this explosion. The flame shot up more than 50 feet. This is video right after the line exploded and caught fire. Columbia Gas Transmission Corporation says it's a 20 inch line and they're investigating what happened. Breaking news. Good afternoon, everyone. Chopper 11 over breaking news under the 31st Street Bridge, an armored car heist, and we have learned one person is dead. The gunfire rang out just about an hour ago. And police have been all over the area searching for the man, and we've heard them give out a description on the scanners. Channel 11 News reporter Gordon Lesh live there talking to witnesses. Gordon, good evening. David, good evening. Uh, sources here tell me that one guard is dead and another is missing. Take a look over my shoulder here and you can see the front end of that armored vehicle parked there. It's from the Garda Armored Car Company. Right now it's parked underneath the 31st Street Bridge here at Railroad Street in the Strip District. The shooting happened sometime between 3.30 and 4 o'clock this afternoon. Police are talking to witnesses in the area. But officers tell me when they arrived, they found one guard dead inside and the second guard missing. Wanted for killing his partner and stealing more than $2 million. According to the criminal complaint filed tonight, 22-year-old Kenneth Canias Jr. called an unidentified witness just after one yesterday afternoon and said, I bleeped up. My life is over. The caller asked, what, did you kill someone? Canias was silent for several seconds, then said yes. He encountered several individuals in South Florida who he confided in regarding his criminal activity. He admitted his identity uh, and he gave some, he, he was cooperative when he was arrested. Ken Conius was arrested inside this Pompano Beach, Florida home early Tuesday morning. I went inside the house here and talked to a lady who rented him a room. Well, how long has he been renting a room here? About two weeks. Two weeks, okay. Can we see his room? This was his room. Wow. We cleaned it up. This woman told me Conius rented a room in her brother's home in this section of Pompano Beach, surrounded by other small homes and just blocks away from a main road. Investigators from Pittsburgh made their very first trip here to the home where Ken Conius was arrested earlier this week. And our camera was rolling when police moved in. This is exclusive video of police surrounding the house in Pompano Beach Thursday afternoon. The raid is going down right now. Investigators just arrived here a second ago. You see him standing at the door right now. For more than two hours, police searched the home, questioned the residents about Ken Conius, where he had been hiding, who had been helping him. Among those who showed up to talk to police, two dancers Conius had been involved with, including one who was with him the night police arrested him. The big story tonight, the winter storm. The snow still falling lightly. How much more we'll see and when it will finally shut off. Plus, the dangerous conditions on the roads. We're tracking the accidents and the trouble spots. And we're asking road crews why they couldn't keep up. Thumped on us fast and hard. It's all part of our live Severe Weather Team 11 coverage. Channel 11 News at 5 starts right now. Live, local, link ranking. Channel 11 News starts with severe weather coverage. Good evening, everyone. Western Pennsylvania in a grip of a winter storm. This is a live look from our crew in Butler County as the snow just keeps coming down. Our traffic tracker is out in Allegheny County monitoring sometimes dangerous road conditions out there. And in the Pittsburgh area, the parkways are still seeing plenty of slow going traffic. We have a number of closings to tell you about. Look at the bottom of your screen for all of the new faster closing systems that show you exactly what's going on. And you know, several people know firsthand just how bad it is out there. Some people having to work today had trouble getting in, and it's not over yet. We have live Severe Weather Team 11 coverage for you tonight, starting with Chief Meteorologist Stephen Cropper. Stephen? 
Vince Darriant, this started uh, in earnest really about 9 o'clock this morning, falling fast and furious at times. And then we had a little bit of a break. And as you take a look at the latest Storm Tracker Doppler 11 radar, you can see that break's now filling back in. Butler down to Pittsburgh, a slight break, but back to the west, more snow showers beginning to fill back in from about Washington County northward. This system's kind of been coming in phases. The first round producing that steadier rainfall this morning, spreading northward. Now we're looking at the back edge of the system moving across Ohio through Columbus. This will rotate through overnight tonight and through the evening and overnight. And so we will get a little more in the way of some light snow and maybe a little wintry mix. But overall, the bulk of the storm is beginning to wind down. Well, we found slow traffic and accidents all over the region. A section of the Parkway West was shut down earlier today because a tractor trailer jackknifed in the outbound lanes on Green Tree Hill. I-70 westbound was closed in Buffalo Township, Washington County because of the jackknifed truck. Our photographer had a tough time getting to that scene because of the slow moving traffic. No one was hurt in the crash. And that same crew found another tractor trailer overturned along I-70 East near exit 6. All lanes were blocked in that area. And I want to show you right now, this is a live look at conditions on the Parkway East near Church Hill. It has been a trouble spot for most of the day, but as you can see right now, the roads just look wet and traffic is moving through there pretty good right now. Now, areas to the north, well, they got more snow today. Yeah, several accidents have been reported in Butler County throughout the day. Channel 11's Amy Marcinkowitz has been tracking this angle of the story. So what's it look like out there now, Amy? Well, there is actually the snow has stopped a little bit, still coming down, but you can barely see it. Quite a difference from uh, this morning. I mean, the snow just started coming down hot and heavy this morning about 10 o'clock, and it just kept coming and coming. Finally wrapped up about 3 o'clock this afternoon, the heavy big stuff. But let me show you how much we got. We're going to estimate this. I'm not a meteorologist, but I'll show you. We got about uh, four inches here in the Evans City, Jackson Township area. We were out and about in this all day long, and I'm telling you, we couldn't get anywhere fast. This is kind of a side street right here where we are. This is 528, and you can still see it is snow covered. It's sloppy out here. Over there, we you see the traffic moving really slow. And then there's an on-ramp right there, an off-ramp here in Evans City. Boy, we saw so many people getting stuck there. Tonight on 11 at 11, Superstorm Sandy. It's bringing down trees and power lines across the area. The tree hit the ground and uh, pulled the wires out. Plus, big problems in the Big Apple. Part of an apartment collapses and a construction crane dangles from a high-rise in Manhattan. Heavy rains and high winds overnight, plus a flood warning still in effect. I'll go hour by hour on Storm Tracks to show you what to expect. And it's snow that's causing big problems in parts of West Virginia. We'll take you to one of the hardest hit areas, all part of severe Weather Team 11 coverage. Live, local, link breaking. Channel 11 News 11 at 11 starts with severe weather coverage. Superstorm Sandy bringing strong winds and rain to the area right now. Live look from the Mon Moor. Flood warning in effect tonight there. This area closed to drivers tomorrow. And now to New York City. A live look as construction crane dangles from a high rise in mid Manhattan. It collapsed in the high winds and 900 people in a nearby hotel had to be evacuated because of the potential danger. There is a lot going on right now, so you are in the right place. Storm expected to get worse as the rain continues. In fact, there are a number of school closings rolling across the bottom of your screen. Here now is the very latest on Sandy tonight. The storm made landfall along the New Jersey coast near Atlantic City around 8 p.m. Eastern time. Storms already knocked out power to 1.5 million customers Many more are expected. And the snow, the big story in West Virginia. Look at that. Some parts of the state could see three feet. That's three feet, not three inches. One traffic crash killed a woman is being blamed on Sandy. We have our reporters stationed everywhere from here in Pittsburgh to New Jersey, West Virginia. We have all the angles of this historic storm covered. We begin, though, with our chief meteorologist, Stephen Cropper, in Severe Weather Center 11. Stephen. Hey, David Darrieth, record breaking and historic. This storm expands about 1,000 miles from the east coast into the mainland and the Midwest. We're watching the spiraling bands of rain continuing to move through parts of western Pennsylvania and 
particular, the darker green, the reds and yellows, putting down very heavy rainfall and now mixing with some snow around Latrobe and in the higher elevation, some accumulating snow. Let me show you the latest on Storm Tracker Doppler 11 radar network and straight in. You can see that bright banding of red and yellow, that representative of some higher elevation snow, which is mixing in with rainfall. As I mentioned, Latrobe getting some light snow as well as the uh, areas around Seven Springs. Dick Barron saying up to seven inches of snow at last check there and even more as you travel to the south. Flood warning is in effect. This is the highest level of alert streets, creeks and streams. If you live near a creek or a stream and it normally is flood prone, heed that warning as you travel out the door early tomorrow morning, especially before daybreak. Water rising, reports of some high water in many areas and with the uh, leaves on the ground and some of the drains clogged, the streets will be clogged as well with water. Steady to uh, gusty winds overnight tonight. He's still with gust at the 35, 40 mile per hour range. Had a report up around 48 miles an hour in Westmoreland County. And then there is the snow. The blizzard warning continues for Preston County in West Virginia, Garrett County in Maryland as well. So a lot to talk about tonight. Coming up in the full forecast in less than 10 minutes, I'll walk you hour by hour through the latest data that shows the rainfall forecast and when the storm will finally move out. We'll see you then. All right, Stephen, thanks. Well, parts of Westmoreland County dealing with high water. In the past few minutes, we sent a crew to Brigade Lane in Ligonier. We've confirmed crews ordered people out of their homes there due to the flooding. Emergency crews are working overtime to make sure everyone stays safe. Channel 11's Brandon Hudson continues our big story coverage now from Greensburg. We are just north of Greensburg here at the Crabtree Volunteer Fire Department. It's one of the fire departments that's here on standby waiting for anything to happen this evening. I talked to firefighters. They tell me that they are keeping an eye on the utility poles and the branches from trees that may fall in the roadways. Right now we are dealing with a steady rainfall and some strong winds. Just to give you an idea of how strong these winds are, take a look at that flag off in the distance. You can see it's being carried by the wind. Rain pretty much nonstop throughout the night and some gusty winds out here downtown. The Mon Wharf is going to be closed tomorrow. They've already announced that. And here is the reason why the Mon River is almost a 17 feet already. It floods this area at 18 feet and is going to go much higher. It's expected to get up to more than 23 feet uh, come Wednesday. Large portions of the city without power, much of it underwater too. the superstorm causing major structural problems in New York City as well. Much of New York in the dark after a reported explosion at the Con Ed building earlier. The city's main utility cut power to part of downtown Manhattan after water began spilling over a seawall. Winds from Sandy being blamed for the partial collapse of a building in Manhattan. Part of the facade of the four story building there in the West Village came down tonight. The rooms inside were exposed, but Amazingly, no one hurt. The storm's gale force winds partially ripped a crane off the side of an unfinished skyscraper in New York City, the dangling dangerously there from its platform high above West 57th Street. Emergency responders have closed off part of that street. People in nearby buildings have been evacuated. The storm made landfall around 8 tonight in southern New Jersey. That area was hit hard by the storm. Our Julie Fine traveled to Atlantic City, where usually it's usually a place that looks more like a ghost town tonight. This is downtown Atlantic City. Way back there is the convention center. You can barely see that. That's where many police and firefighters are right now. You can see the sidewalks essentially gone here in downtown. We wanted to give you the full scope of the storm. You got the rain, the wind, the flooding in Pittsburgh right now and the surrounding area. You saw what was going along the East Coast. This is Snowshoe, West Virginia, a full scale blizzard. Already about 10 inches of snow is falling. When we left today, we got rain in the valleys, even just a couple, about a half hour from here, it was still rain. The snow started to pick up as we came up in elevation. Then we got the snowshoe. Wind was already gusting to 30 miles per hour. Right now, 60 mile per hour wind gusts, about 10 inches of snow on the ground. All said and done by Wednesday morning, two to three feet. Severe weather coverage. Good evening, everyone. Flash flooding paralyzes several communities. Here along Route 51, businesses are pumping out the water. And we even found a garbage bag floating down the street. This is home video from a viewer in McKeesport. The water was rising quickly along Fifth Avenue. Rain was falling at the rate of an inch an hour. In many areas, the water became just too high, with drivers becoming stranded, needing to be pulled to safety. The calls came in one after another. Reports of flooding, 
people trapped, roads closed. And even right now, we are still under a flood warning. We have live severe weather Team 11 coverage of it all with Chief Meteorologist Stephen Cropper and our crews out in the hardest hit places. We're going to begin in Pittsburgh's Bon Air neighborhood where people had to be rescued from their cars. Channel 11's Julie Fine is live with the latest. Julie. Well, I was here earlier when the water was really high and the water rescues were going on. I want you to take a look at what's going on around me now. That is all the debris that's been cleaned up here so far. That's problem over there by that bridge over the creek. Now I want to show you what's on the other side of me. You can see all the traffic right here on 51. It is still closed in this direction, but earlier today, some pretty scary moments for drivers. Water's rising fast, reaching the doors. Cars almost floating, not driving. Sawmill Run Boulevard was hit with the flash flooding fast. We found drivers towing cars to help as other crews rescued people. We were all just coming down the road and the road just flooded. But water just started coming out of the creek and going crazy. As we talked to George, more people needed help. You can see here the water rising. Firefighters had to go out in the knee deep water to help other people out of their cars. This is a tornado warning in effect for Westmoreland County, also for uh, Indiana County. Here's Armagh, here's Blairsville, and Ligonier, you are right under the gun here. If you're watching us from Ligonier, here is Route 30. You'll want to take shelter in a basement, the lowest level of your house. If you don't have a basement, go to an interior room, try to get away from the windows and doors. But at a minimum, this storm is producing some lightning, also producing some very heavy rainfall. And again, it's a radar indicated tornado by the National Weather Service in Pittsburgh which just basically means that they have seen signatures on radar showing some rotation with this storm. They have reported a tornado. This is the emergency manager reporting the tornado at 528 this afternoon, rotating debris. When you see the funnel, the actual tornado, most times that's the debris starting to rotate around that that was confirmed at 528 along with trees being snapped down, trees being snapped down in a rotating type pattern as well as structural damage. This is all on 7-Eleven. We have a picture of a tree in a house. This is on Wilpin Street. This is in Ligonier Township. You can see the tree right into the house in that area right now. So we do have at this point, and we've had it for about the last 20 minutes, a confirmed tornado in eastern Westmoreland County. Neville Island was hit hard by the first line of storms. The giant inflatable dome at the Robert Moore Sports Complex collapsed. Let's go live to Channel 11's Kara Sapida with a look at the damage and what witnesses saw. Kara? This gigantic dome has completely flattened. Take a look. All that stands here is a door alone. There are golf balls everywhere. Insulation from inside of the dome everywhere. You can see the green outside right now. There were 10 people inside when the dome ripped. You see the damage there from the storms today. It was a wild weather day. A tornado touched down in Westmoreland County. We're getting a look there at the damage. And the tornado was caught on camera. Viewer Sean McCarty and Ryan Hitton gave us this amazing cell phone video to our Julie Fine just a little while ago. You can see a funnel cloud making its way through Westmoreland County. Take a look at that. Amazingly, no one was seriously hurt. And Chopper 11 in the air just after the storm strike. You can see trees snap like twigs, branches covering homes. And wild winds actually brought down the inflatable dome at the Robert Morris University Sports Complex on Neville Island with people inside. And Pittsburgh's mo pow most powerful radar looks much different tonight than it did at five. Our chief meteorologist Stephen Cropper will tell us whether things will settle down for the weekend. Well, we followed today's severe storms all day long from the tornado watch early this afternoon. To the reports of the tornado touching down during our early evening newscast, we were certainly quite busy around here. And tonight we have Team 11 coverage for you. We sent a team of reporters to check out the damage in Allegheny and Westmoreland counties from the ground and in the air. By far, the worst of the damage came along Route 70. 7-Eleven Corridor in Ligonier Township, Westmoreland County. That's where Channel 11's Vin Sims begins our Team 11 coverage this evening. Vince. Well, Darius, as we were making our way here, we saw a lot of damage throughout the area, many of it down trees. Let me show you exactly what I'm talking about. Take a look right here. You see, this is a hole. Well, the reason the hole is here is because the tree has been blown out of that hole, just ripped out of the ground right here. Well, you can see the size of this tree, but let me tell you, on our way here, we saw some that were a lot larger than this, and it actually made it difficult for us to make it to the damage scene. 
This is the first sight we saw making our way to the damage. A large tree blocking our way, so we had to find another way around. Once we made it on road 711, we found crews already working to clear trees off of power lines. There was also debris hanging from those lines swept up by the storm. It hasn't officially been ruled a tornado, but two young witnesses describes a swirling sky for me. The clouds started like funneling and started spinning, and all of a sudden like the rain started coming and the wind picked up and the branches were like 100 feet up in the air just coming in real fast and it was crazy. These are planes to nowhere and of course the runway is paved with red ink. Small airlines with a big payroll. A Target 11 investigation uncovers millions of tax dollars being spent to fly nearly empty airplanes. It's a controversial program that keeps airlines flying into rural communities, including here in Pennsylvania. And our investigator Rick Earl flew on one of those flights to find out, is this why we're broke? Rick. Well, David, it's called the Essential Air Service Program. The money comes from a tax the FAA charges foreign flights when they fly into U.S. airspace. Now, we bought two tickets and boarded a flight to Venango County to see who's using the service and if it's worth it. We arrived at the Cleveland Airport before dawn checked in for our flight. It's 8 o'clock in the morning and we are at Cleveland Airport. In just about a half hour we're going to get on board that plane and fly over to Franklin. The plane seats 19 people. There are a lot of empty seats. Seven passengers in all, including me. And What's an affordable monthly car payment for you? $300 to $400? What about $1,500? That's how much we found one city shelling out every month for just one vehicle. It's not a Mercedes, which we found for $589 a month, not even a Jaguar for $728. We're talking about a Dodge Grand Caravan. Pittsburgh's Parks and Rec Department rents six minivans every summer to transport lifeguards and pool supplies at a cost of nearly $1,500 a month per van for a whopping total of $36,000. County Executive Rich Fitzgerald makes $90,000, Mayor Luke Ravenstall $105, and Governor Tom Corbett $174,000. But the man in charge of promoting Pittsburgh earned more than all of them. Visit Pittsburgh's Joe McGrath made more than $353,000 last year. But should your tax dollars be footing the bill to preserve this part of our past, or should they be replaced with more efficient, longer-lasting structures? covered bridges in green in Washington counties. Everybody that comes to visit us from out of town is excited to see them. Have lured visitors for decades. Uh, I've noticed a lot of people with weddings come out here. But many are starting to show their age. The cost to maintain them adding up. There are now more docks here along the river, like this one here on the North Shore right behind me. And if you look across the other side of the Allegheny River, you see the point over there where there are docks. They also want to use high-speed taxis, but critics say it's a waste of your tax dollars. You paid for the tunnel under the river and the bridges over them. Now you may be paying for water taxis. Now this absolutely isn't anything the taxpayers should be footing the bill for. Uh, these are things that are drowning Pennsylvanians in debt. Target 11 discovered the federal government has set aside a million dollars to build a water taxi dock on the south side and another half million for a private company to buy high-speed water taxis. That company would also have to chip in a half million. Target 11 investigates what is being billed as a modern day gold rush. Marcellus Shale drilling has already made some folks in our area a lot of money, but some claim the process known as fracking is to blame for their water woes. Target 11 investigator Rick Earl has been talking to people on both sides of this issue and Rick, what did you find out? Well, Peggy, this has divided neighbors in some communities. On one side, residents who claim the drilling is destroying their water. On the other side, landowners and drillers who say it's perfectly safe and there's no scientific evidence linking fracking to contamination. And now they have a brand new study they say proves their point. The DEP says this is aesthetic. We can drink this. We can have coffee later. And Kim I McAvoy began having coffee. well water problems at her home in Conoquinas in Butler County last summer. Today, it is nearly dried up. But there it goes. I'm not even getting a gallon of water. I'm done. I lived here 16 years, and the only thing I know that's changed in my environment is these gas wells. The gas wells began popping up last year. So did water complaints from other neighbors. Turned on the bathroom sink water and found come out. We're talking about radon. It is a colorless, odorless, radioactive gas. Target 11 consumer investigator Robin Taylor discovered the problem is far worse than most of us realize. Robin? 
Well, I found out all of the counties surrounding Pittsburgh have average radon ratings that are above the EPA guideline of four. So we decided to test 20 homes in the area. An alarming number of the radon tests came back high. 11 homes in Allegheny, Armstrong, Westmoreland, Washington, Beaver and Butler counties all tested in the danger zone and one in Beaver County tested the highest. So we talked to homeowners who had extremely high levels and learned what can be done. Kathy and Russ Glenn's raised their daughter in this Brighton Township home. Little did they know they were exposed to dangerous levels of radon the whole time. They had the highest reading in our test of 16.7, four times the EPA guideline. Just the fact that this long-term exposure has occurred, uh, and we've both smoked off and on for years, unfortunately, so that doubles the risk. Radon is the second leading cause of lung cancer. It kills about 800 Pennsylvanians each year. The breakers are in thousands of homes in the Pittsburgh area built in the 1960s, 70s, and 80s. They were made by Federal Pacific Electric, a company that no longer exists. Fire investigators have linked the faulty breakers to nearly 3,000 fires a year. There's a lesson here. Make sure you know what you're getting yourself into before you sign a contract. 77-year-old Shirley McCoy moved to Texas earlier this year to be closer to her family. She'd lived in this house in Cannonsburg for 42 years and decided to auction off her things. Patterson's auction service was to sell her car and household furniture and keep 15%. They overstepped their bounds and they just ran roughshod over her. The Pattersons were trusted friends, but that friendship quickly soured when the case ended up in court. We're here to do a story on it. I don't want a story. Are you kidding me? Explosive. Score! Magical. Curry does it again. No Combination, no adversity. No Relentless. Woo! Tenacious. Scores! Fantastic. They're having a monumental season. Passionate. How's that for a statement? Spins around. Score! Excellent. Dynamic. You don't win hockey games if you don't play with heart. Hulk and fires. Consol Energy Center is primed for another chapter of the Penguins set to host cross-state rival Philadelphia with a lot at stake in the Eastern Conference. The fans are ready for hockey. We're 30 minutes away from the Penguins getting ready to take on the Flyers. Both teams are on the ice, and it's another sellout. Stay where you are. You have the best seat in the house for the Flyers and Penguins on Channel 11. Good afternoon and welcome to the Consol Energy Center. I'm Albie Oxenrider and the Penn's playoff push is in full swing. I'm Bill Phillips. We'll also be joined by Rich Walsh and Phil Bork in just a few moments. But first, the latest on Penguins defenseman Chris Letang. About an hour or so ago, I spoke with head coach Dan Bilesma and Bilesma told me that he will be a game time decision. Right now, it's time for us to head to Indianapolis where Channel 11's Rich Walsh has been talking with a local product that had a big game for the Giants tonight, Rich. Bill, the celebration is still going on behind me. It was crazy on the field after the Giants comeback win against the Patriots, but my goal was to make my way through that crowd and find former pit fullback Henry Hynoski, who made a few huge plays in tonight's big win. As we made our way through the madness, we ran into MVP Eli Manning being escorted off the field, and five minutes later, catching up with Hynoski, who can't believe just a year ago was playing at Pitt, and now is a Super Bowl champion. Hey, a pick guy, pick guy wins a Super Bowl. How's it feel? Unbelievable. I, I, I can't describe it. It's uh, by far the best feeling I've ever had. The guy who had so many big moments over the years, it's Lamar Woodley. He's been bothered by a nagging hamstring injury this season, but he has made some big plays. He sure has. Perhaps the biggest came in a win over Cincinnati. Woodley made an interception that not only turned the game around, but perhaps the season. Uh, we haven't been playing good in the fourth quarter. Uh, we've been giving up leads in the fourth quarter and losing the football game. And I think we came out in that Cincinnati game. Uh, we came out and we played hard in the fourth quarter. Now, it's time for John Fedko's Skylux, sponsored by Eaton Park. Good evening, everybody. I'm John Fedko. Welcome to Skylights, the Whippeal quarterfinals tonight. We had our cameras everywhere. Let's go. Neutral sites tonight, and we're going to start in Norwood. 
Woodland Hills versus Gateway. First quarter, Woody High's freshman sensation, Miles Sanders. And I can see for miles and miles. Miles Sanders scores 7 0 Woody High. Gateway's Thomas Woodson to Delvon Randall to the 38 yard line. We'll set up Thomas Woodson to Monte Nicholson. Watch the flip. Game tied 7 all. Second quarter, Woody High's commander, Cody McClellan, pumps, then goes to Tom Green. Let's turn to Triple A now. West Mifflin versus Mars at beautiful Fox Chapel. And West Mifflin has the speedy sensation, Jimmy Hot Wheels Wheeler. Here he is. Hot Wheels, look at the moves, look at the speed. 21 yards to the touchdown, 7 0 West Mifflin. Next series, it's Hot Wheels again. Jimmy Hot Wheels Wheeler, 19 yard touchdown, 14 0 Titans. When we heard about it, time seemed to stop. A newborn baby kidnapped from the hospital, every minute feeling like a lifetime for his frightened family. Somebody got my baby, please, God, please, please, my grandson. We were with police tracking down every lead. And there when they put someone in cuffs. Right now, the search for baby Bryce. Breaking news coverage starts right now. Live, local, late breaking. Channel 11 News starts with breaking news. Somebody got my grandson. Please return my baby. God, please. A tearful and desperate plea after a newborn baby is taken right from the hospital by a stranger wearing hospital scrubs. We've been breaking into programming all afternoon. And we are certainly hoping that our coverage will help reunite the family with missing Bryce Coleman. We have several reporters working right yeah, now to bring it. you all of the angles in this story. Four of them will be live in the next few minutes. But we begin tonight with Vincent, our first reporter at McGee. Vince? Yes, we've been here live at McGee since this all went out. And when we first got here, we made it here and we saw police still swarming here to McGee Women's Hospital with their sirens and lights going as they've been searching for this missing three day old little baby. Take a look. This is the picture. This is the baby they want you to see. This is the picture. I was able to talk with his grandmother and she told me that his name is Bryce Coleman. That is the name of the little three day old little baby boy. Now, police swarmed here to the hospital when this was reported. That grandmother told me a woman posing as the mother's sister came in dressed in scrubs and somehow removed the baby from the nursery as the family was preparing to be discharged today. Now, as you can imagine, this family is absolutely devastated right now. Here is the grandmother telling me about this and making an emotional plea for the return of that little boy. Somebody came in the hospital and claimed they was my daughter's sister and they took her newborn baby that she just had on Tuesday. <laughs> and we don't know where it's at. Somebody got my grandson. Please return my baby. God, please. An innocent baby going to thin air. What was they doing? And then on the other day, like the day before yesterday, I was told that they had to come and collect all the babies and put all the babies in the nursery because they had three babies that had the same number or something, the nurse or something that made a mistake or something and put the same number on three of the babies. So what's really going on in here? You know what I mean? I don't know. I don't get it. <laughs> Somebody got my baby. Please, God, please return my grandson. <laughs> A very emotional plea from the grandmother who I interviewed when we first made it here to the hospital. Now I've been able to meet up with the sister of the mother whose baby was taken. This is Talisha. You've been here with the family right now. How is the family holding up at this point? How is your sister holding up inside? Not good at all. I mean, we're all hurting. Um, we just plead that everyone do their best and to send in any information that they know to let us know where he is. Um, my sister's heartbroken. This is, you know, her baby boy, and we just want to see him back safely. And at this point, have you been able to get any information on where the investigation is going at this point, the family side of it? Um, as far as I know, they have a person in entrance. Um, I'm not sure who she is, um, but that's all we know for right now. And she was being able to be discharged today. They were getting ready to leave the hospital yes, today. That's how she got away with the baby. They actually, actually the nurse actually cut the, the band off and um, she was able to get away. And she was in my sister's room posing as a nurse she's student. She was in there three times. Hold on one second. Let's get a little more information, sir. Your name? Dale, I'm Talisha's husband. husband. So this woman was actually in your sister's room. In law's bedroom three times prior to her taking my nephew. Okay. So at this point, if again, the plea that you want the public to hear coming from the family, you being your sister that's in there that has lost her baby right now, your nephew, what's the plea you want to make? 
my plea is to, if you know any information, contact police, contact me. I'll post it on Facebook. Just, just please, we want to get him back safely. My sister's hurting. I'm trying to be strong for her. Um, and that's all we can do right now is keep God, um, keep God first and, you know, lift us up in prayer, please. All right. Thank you very much for staying strong, talking with me on this. Thank you very much. As you saw that emotional plea from the grandmother, emotional plea from the family right here. They want everybody to be on the lookout for this three day old little boy that has been taken here from McGee Women's Hospital. We'll be here live throughout this evening and bringing you the very latest updates that we can. Reporting live in Oakland, Vince Sims, Channel 11 News. Yeah, Vince, uh, very good interviews. You can really feel the, the pain and the desperation of the family there. The suspect looked the part. She says she bought the scrubs to wear into the hospital. The sales clerk who sold those clothes talked to police. We were there when this happened. Julie Fine, live in Oakland with her story. Julie. Well, right after we got here, so did police. In fact, they just left a few minutes ago. Now we're here at Life Uniform. Take a look over here. You can see they sell a lot of medical equipment, a lot of scrubs. Now police talked to a woman who was working at the uniform store. She told us a woman was right here when the doors opened earlier today. Now here's video of the police going through Life Uniform. Police say the suspect in the case may have bought this black scrub top you see right here and paid with cash. Now the store manager did have a short conversation with her. Here is what she told us happened. She just said she needed a scrub top so she start, was starting to train because I asked her what hospital she was at. She said McGee, she said she was starting to train and that's, is that okay? Now, police may have a clue here. Apparently, this woman did leave her name when she made that purchase. We're live in Oakland. Julie Fine, Channel 11 News. Yeah, Julie, she certainly did, and police went straight to the address of the name given at that scrub store, and so did we. We watched as a person was taken away in handcuffs, hiding her face there. Channel 11's Kara Sapaita saw all of this go down. She found out more about this woman and what she means to this investigation. Kara. Well, police rushed to this Wilkinsburg home. They were hopeful they were going to find the suspect and more importantly, this baby. That did not happen. We were there as they took this woman away in handcuffs. They're calling her a person of interest at this point, not a suspect. Take a look at this video outside of that home. Here she is with a towel over her head, leaving the Wilkinsburg home in handcuffs. It happened around 3 o'clock this afternoon at a home on Lakedon Road. Neighbors say Pittsburgh police and Wilkinsburg police rushed in from all directions directions down this one way street. Investigator tell me this woman's name was the one used at that store in Oakland where the woman bought the UPMC nurses uniform. Police say she as well as several others inside of that home were being very cooperative. After that woman was taken away, I had the chance to talk to the sergeant disappointed that they did not find the baby at the home. He said they're following up on each and every tip to try and find the baby boy. A search of the residence and you know, it did not turn up any signs of a child at this point. Right now you have no idea where this baby is? Not at this point. I should let you know that sources tell me that this woman had a strong alibi today. She was with her family. Of course, they did take her to Pittsburgh Police Headquarters for questioning. Live in Wilkinsburg, I'm Kara Sapida, Channel 11 News. Thanks, Kara. Very busy afternoon for police and for our crews tracking down every lead. Here is a timeline of the events today. First, 154. The first reports came in of the abduction at 201 in the afternoon. We confirmed the news with police. Then at 213, we brought you the grandmother's tearful plea for help, which you just heard. At 229, we were at the Oakland uniform shop where police believe the scrubs were bought. You saw that just a moment ago. At 321, we were in Wilkinsburg, as we saw somebody brought out in cuffs. Kara just had that, but this was not the suspect. We will stay on this story, of course, until we can give you a time for when the baby is found. And of course, there are some security measures in place to make sure that someone just doesn't walk in and steal another baby. Target 11's Rick Earl is finding out how they're supposed to work. Rick? Well, Darius, first of all, this is a very rare occurrence. It happens fewer than 10 times a year in the United States. Most hospitals, including McGee, have measures in place to protect newborns. I've learned tonight that the hospital immediately went into a code I, which indicates trouble with an infant. The hospital was immediately locked down this afternoon. Now, one of the most important security measures is the ID bracelet. Every newborn at McGee is immediately outfitted with a bracelet on the wrist and the ankle. There's a chip in the bracelet, and if that infant gets too close to 
any door in the hospital, the doors automatically lock down. But we've learned that the woman who kidnapped the infant cut the bracelets off. We spoke with some mothers and expectant mothers who were in the hospital when this happened, and they tell us the hospital was put in lockdown, and they had guards at every door searching people and guards in the parking lot searching every car. Actually, they have the front doors all blocked off, and they just won't let people on the second floor because I guess that's where they took the baby at or something. Sending everybody through that um, one door, and there's a cop at the door, and they got everything shut down with cops. So you can't get in or get out without getting your car checked. They're checking all the cars and stuff. Now, I've also learned tonight that the only hospital employees allowed to hold newborns at McGee wear a little pink stork on their ID badge, and parents are told not to let anyone hold their infant unless they have that ID badge with that pink stork. In this case, we know the kidnapper was wearing blue hospital scrubs, but we don't know if she had one of those ID badges. That is the very latest reporting live in the newsroom. Rick Earl, Channel 11 News. And you're probably wondering by now why no Amber Alert has been issued as of yet. Well, we checked with Pittsburgh police in the last five minutes and they tell us they are working with state police to get that Amber Alert going, but it just hasn't happened yet. We wanna give you another look at Bryce Coleman. You can count on us to bring you updates on him until he's found. And you should know we broke this big story on Facebook and on Twitter and on the web. And we updated it every second during the day. You can continue to follow the latest details through our social media sites. We'll give you up to the second information no matter where you are. In a busy afternoon of breaking news continues. Shots fired during a robbery in Wilkinsburg. We rushed to Singer Place just after 4 this afternoon. Saw officers with canines searching for suspects. No word on whether anyone was hurt there. We'll bring you breaking news whenever and wherever it happens. This story we broke on the web, a purse snatching spree in the South Hills. Renee Kaminsky got a hold of surveillance video, discovered a connection between the suspects. Renee. David, this is a first police here in Scott Township say a family and one of their friends stalking customers here at the Walmart in Scott Township and the one over in North Fayette for their purses. I got a hold of the surveillance video of this family in action. He's pacing her, waiting for his opportunity. No matter how many times North Fayette Police showed it to me, watching this man follow this unsuspecting Walmart shopper into the parking lot, waiting for the right moment to grab her purse, was creepy. Um, she has it on her form, and then he grabs it. And then he pulls her across the parking lot and throws her down. Police say the 55-year-old woman was hurt, but she kept her purse and wits about her enough to identify Andrew Blanning as her attacker. According to police, Blanning and this woman, Nita Kurtz, along with her two adult children, Heather and David Barton, were working together targeting shoppers of Walmarts in North Fayette and Scott Township. Oh, here he is. Scott Township Police showed me the family in action on August 9th. While mom and daughter pretended to shop, the son, police say, staked out the entryway, but all three family members were looking for potential victims. The lady with the purse is over here, out of the view. Police say the man in the baseball cap is Barton, and even though there are people all around him, he's about to boldly steal a woman's purse from a shopping cart. Scoping her out. See, now he's backing up, and he's going to start boogieing, and he's going to boogie right across the parking lot. He's getting ready, and there he goes. And police say before they got caught and were arrested, they did use the, this victim's credit cards to buy an iPod, an iPad, and McDonald's. Reporting live tonight in Scott Township, I'm Renee Kaminsky, Channel 11 News. Well, we're glad you're with us this evening, and we're just getting started, too. And, of course, we're staying focused on the search for baby Bryce Coleman. He's been missing for a few hours now. We're talking to family, to police. We are trying to get the word out the best we can. Keep it right here for the latest developments as they happen. And weather-wise, summer is back. Good evening, everyone. Let me show you the latest temperatures. 83 now at Pittsburgh International Airport. I'm putting together the most recent data showing a forecast warm-up for the weekend. I'll take you hour by hour. Coming up. Melvin Knight is being sentenced for the torture death of a mentally challenged woman after a key witness describes what he believes was the fatal blow. He talked to our Courtney Brennan. Courtney? 
Darius, today we heard very detailed, very technical testimony from Dr. Cyril Wecht. And you might be asking yourself, is it really necessary to hear all these details? Because the defendant, Melvin Knight, already pleaded guilty to killing Jennifer Doherty. But the answer is that yes, it is important because if this case should ever come up on appeal, the prosecution needs to show that it entered every detail, every bit of evidence into the record. Melvin Knight's death penalty trial continues, and today we heard how the final blows he delivered to Jennifer Doherty killed the mentally challenged woman who had been tortured for days. These are injuries that would have produced a very significant uh, pain and physical as well as emotional uh, suffering. As Dr. Cyril Weck described the extreme physical and emotional pain Doherty endured, a person had to wonder how the torture did not kill her. After all, Doherty was beaten with a towel rack, force-fed concoctions of bleach and human waste and kicked and punched. But even though the 30-year-old woman was bruised and beaten, Dr. Weck told the jury the seven stab wounds to her chest killed her. I think she would have remained conscious for no more than one to two minutes after infliction of the stab wounds of the chest. Knight admitted that he was the one holding the knife. After Weck's damning testimony, Knight's attorneys tried to gain ground during the cross-examination of Knight's ex-girlfriend, Amber Meidinger. The defense grilled Meidinger on the fact that her stories have changed from when she first talked to police to her current testimony. The defense also questioned her memory and brought up the fact that she too suffers from depression and a bipolar diagnosis. And when Amber Meidinger got off the stand today, she was crying. And as she left the courtroom, she stopped right in front of Jennifer Doherty's parents. And she said to them, I'm sorry, I'm just so sorry. Another development in court today, one juror was dismissed from this case and replaced. This is the same juror who went to the judge earlier this week and said that he accidentally overheard someone talking about the case out in the public area. A reason for his dismissal, however, was not given. Reporting live at the Westmoreland County Courthouse tonight, I'm Courtney Brennan, Channel 11 News. And West Nile worries spreading across the country. Local health leaders are taking action. This is video from Mosquito Spray last week. The health department will spray Pittsburgh's Bloomfield neighborhood tonight from 8 till 11. More than 100 mosquito samples have tested positive for West Nile and the county. No human cases, though, have been reported so far. Meantime, sprays are taking place across the country to combat what is on track to be the worst outbreak of West Nile in U.S. history. More than 1,100 cases have been reported across the 38 states. 41 people have died. Almost half those cases are in Texas, where the death toll stands at 28. Your severe weather Team 11 forecast in high definition. Boy, hard to beat a day like today. Plenty of sunshine, temperatures right about where they should be, and the humidity down uh, in the comfortable range. So good afternoon, everyone. I hope you had a chance to soak up some of the sunshine. Wanted to start with this uh, satellite shot, which is basically cloud free. Take a look across the western half of Pennsylvania, stretching all the way into uh, parts of West Virginia. Plenty of green, clear real estate there poking through, and that's a sign of cloud free skies so lots of sunshine is what we're tracking it will be more like summer you know the past week or two I was looking over some of the data from two weeks ago we've been in the upper 70s to uh, low 80s which is comfortable but we haven't had those spikes in the mid 80s we're headed back to that as we wrap up tomorrow and head into the weekend there'll be an isolated shower possible but really the setup of this next system is going to be more to our east and I'll pinpoint that on storm tracker coming up right now picture perfect blue sky a couple of white clouds at times 83 the temperature southwesterly wind is on the light side so that will play into some patchy fog again tomorrow morning as was the case this morning it won't be widespread but there could be a couple of pockets of fog 57 at 7 a.m 81 by noon and here we go with the warm-up 86 degrees by five o'clock tomorrow afternoon sunny and warm and i'll tell you that it will be slightly more humid not unbearable not impressive oppressive but it will be a little more humid tomorrow feeling more like summer speaking of which high pressure is the driving influence that south wind coming around it will eventually warm the temps back into the mid 80s during the day tomorrow and again on Saturday and part of the day Sunday too. In fact, let me show you the temperature forecast hour by hour, county by county. You can see the tick upwards for Greensburg coming back in 86, 87 degrees by 5 o'clock tomorrow. Jeanette, Irwin, Trafford, you'll be that warm. 86 around Morgantown, Washington, Cannonsburg. You're also going to warm up as well. And there'll be sunshine. A few clouds early at 7 a.m. Here's Storm Tracker, your clock. By noon, just an isolated shower 
shower chance well east of Pittsburgh into the ridges. And by tomorrow night, that isolated shower chance winds down and we're setting up a good looking Saturday too. Here's your forecast for the evening tonight. Be on the lookout for the patchy fog. Otherwise, windows open 57 clear and cool. High temperature tomorrow back to 86, mostly sunny, continued warm. Five day forecast from severe weather team 11. Saturday's high temperature 86, a sweet looking Sunday too. in the week on a Sunday at 85, partly sunny skies. Breaking news. My sister's heartbroken. This is, you know, her baby boy, and we just want to see him back safely. They certainly do. A family's joy shattered. Their newborn was taken right out of McGee Hospital today. Tonight we have team coverage of a baby kidnapped. And our entire team is working on this major breaking story. Our Vin Sims talked with the missing baby's family. Julie Fine interviewed a woman who came face to face with a suspect just hours before the crime. Rick Earl is following security. How does someone walk out of a hospital with a baby? And Kara Sapita following another angle, a woman who's being questioned right now. Well, let's get started with Vince Sims now at McGee Women's Hospital again with the very latest for us live now. Vince. Yes, we have been here all afternoon since this first started happening, breaking. It's been a very active scene around here pretty much all afternoon. Right now, things are starting to slow down just a little bit, but security is still high. We want to first of all show you this picture right now. This is the little boy that they're looking for at this moment. This is the little boy that they're looking for at this moment. This is three day old. Bryce Coleman is the one that they are looking for. We're being told that that little boy was stolen here from McGee Hospital. Now, also want to take a look. This is the video. This is what this scene was looking like earlier when we first arrived here. But they, when they first arrived, a lot of police were arriving on scene and a lot of activity with their lights and sirens going as they were going out full blast search for this little boy here at this time. Now, Again, I did have a chance when I first made it here to talk with the grandmother of this little boy and the little boy's aunt. The family is making a very emotional plea to return this baby, and at the same time, they tell us how this may have happened. Somebody came in the hospital and claimed they was my daughter's sister, and they took her newborn baby that she just had on Tuesday. Oh, <laughs> and we don't know where it's at. Somebody got my grandson. Please return my baby. God, please. An innocent baby going to in here. What was they doing? That's how she got away with the baby. They act, she act, the nurse actually cut the, the band off, and um, she was able to get away. And she was in my sister's room posing as a nurse student. So again, a very emotional plea for that family, hoping for a very positive outcome with this situation right now. We are here at the hospital, and I was hearing from a security guard there some information that may be coming in. I've got to confirm some things right now. We will have an update for you coming your way in just a little bit on some possible information regarding that little baby. Very latest details here at McGee Hospital in Oakland. Vince Sims, Channel 11 News. And our team coverage continues for you right now with Julie Fine tracking the clues police are hoping will lead them to baby Bryce. She joins us live now with more, Julie. Well, we're a couple of blocks from McGee. Police believe this is the store where the suspect may have bought the scrubs. You can see them right here in the window. Police were over here earlier today. They just left here a little while ago. Now you can see police in the store talking to the manager and looking at the merchandise. Now this right here is the black scrub top that this woman bought. The store manager stole it to her early this morning. She then explained to us exactly what happened. There really wasn't anything that unusual about it, honestly. She came in, um, said she needed a scrub top, said she was starting to train today, needed the top to start her job, and I said, okay, took her information like we always do, and she paid with cash, and she was done. Now, right now, you're looking at the doors of the store. We are told that she was here at 9 a.m. when the store opened. Police say that she did leave a name here. We're live in Oakland. Julie Fine, Channel 11 News. Chopper 11 overhead today as a woman was brought in for questioning in this kidnapping case. We know she is not a suspect. It's unclear just how she is connected, though. And our Kara Sapita was there on the ground. She's live now in Wilkinsburg tracking this part of the story for us. Kara? 
Police rushed to this home. They were hopeful they were going to find the suspect and more importantly, the baby. That did not happen. We were there when they took this woman out in handcuffs. They're calling her a person of interest, not a suspect. You'll see she wasn't wearing scrubs. Here she is with a towel over her head, leaving this Wilkinsburg home in handcuffs. It happened around 3 o'clock this afternoon at a home on Lakedon Road. Neighbors say Pittsburgh police and Wilkinsburg police rushed in from all directions down this one way street. Investigators tell me that this woman's name was the one used at that store in Oakland where the woman bought the UPMC nurse's uniform. Police say that this woman, as well as several others inside of that home, were being very cooperative. Police were disappointed that they did not find the baby here. They're following up on every lead. A search of the residence you know, it did not turn up any signs of a child at this point. Right now you have no idea where this baby is? Not at this point. Sources tell me that that woman has a strong alibi. She was with her family all day. They did take her to Pittsburgh Police Headquarters for questioning. I wanted to say that people here in Wilkinsburg keep coming up to our live truck asking us if the baby has been found. Word traveling extremely fast. People here praying the baby is returned to his mother. Live in Wilkinsburg, Kara Sapida, Channel 11 News. Hey, you've got a lot of questions about how this happened. So did we. Let's get right to Rick Earl with what you UPMC... Yeah, David, we just got a timeline from UPMC on how all of this went down and when exactly they called police. Now, UPMC says at 1234, the baby's security bracelet was cut by a nurse and the family was ready to go. The family says another nurse came in claiming to need one more exam and took the child. At 1.15, dad told the staff the baby was missing. UPMC tells us they searched themselves first and called in police at 1.44. That's when people inside the hospital found out too. Actually, they have the front doors all blocked off and they just won't let people on the second floor because I guess that's where they took the baby at or something. Sending everybody through that um, one door and there's a cop at the door and they got everything shut down with cops so you can't get in or get out without getting your car checked. They're checking all the cars and stuff. Now we are just getting some breaking news in on this story. We understand that the baby, the infant, has been found alive and well downtown on 4th Avenue. Police are telling us that they also have the woman, a suspect, in custody. Again, the baby found just minutes ago downtown alive and well on 4th Avenue, and police also have a suspect in custody. That's the very latest information we're getting from the assignment desk. Again, the baby has been found safe and sound downtown. Darius, David. All right, Rick, we do understand that. And if you can stay with us for a little while, Rick, we know you're just getting this information in. Um, Fourth Avenue, uh, do we know if this is in a car, in a house? I mean, was someone with the baby? W what's the detail? We had heard some initial reports that uh, there might have been someone walking the baby in a stroller. That's unconfirmed at this point, but that is the initial information that came in here to the assignment desk was there may have been uh, a woman walking the infant in a stroller, and that's when she was spotted, and then police moved in and, and discovered that this was indeed missing baby Bryce. Do you I, I know you're getting this information just to, you know as we are right back there. Was anybody taken into custody with the child? I mean they found the child but the, the woman you mentioned anybody you know arrested or, or, or taken into custody by police? We understand that police do have the suspect, the woman who took this baby from McGee Hospital, in custody at this hour, right now in custody. Apparently the woman was taken in custody uh, with the baby on 4th Avenue downtown just minutes ago. All right, that is a live picture from Chopper 11 there of the ambulance with baby Bryce inside heading back to the hospital. The baby just a few minutes ago found on 4th Avenue downtown. So that is the good news of this story. The baby abducted Darien uh, just a few hours ago at McGee Women's Hospital. And this certainly couldn't have ended in a better way in that the baby has been found and a suspect also arrested. Rick has been following this story from us he, before us. He joins us live in the newsroom with some more details that he's been working on. Rick. Yeah, Darien, this is a great uh, end to this story, um, we are now looking at live pictures of that ambulance pulling into McGee Hospital right there with the baby, baby Bryce Coleman, the uh, two day old baby that was kidnapped from McGee Hospital earlier this afternoon. That baby was found just a short time ago, alive and well, safe and sound on 4th Avenue downtown. We also understand from Pittsburgh police that a suspect, a female suspect, has been taken into custody. That suspect will be taken over to Major Crimes Headquarters downtown.
down. Uh, the woman apparently was walking uh, the baby in a stroller downtown when police spotted the woman. We're not sure if a tip came in and that led police there, but uh, police moved in and found the baby and the woman there. The woman was taken into custody, the baby taken to uh, McGee Hospital by that ambulance right now to be checked out, but we're told that the baby is safe and sound and is doing very well. We tracked the kidnapping story from the very beginning today. And, and even though baby Bryce Coleman is safe, there's still a lot of questions tonight, like, you know, how did this happen? How did they beat the security system? And obviously, how's he doing and how is his family doing? We are at the hospital where Bryce is being checked out right now, and we're also catching up with the family. Getting a lot of look at the suspect there. She just was brought in to Pittsburgh Police Headquarters. This is new video now. We'll find out more about her tonight. Be sure to check in with WPXI.com and with us on Facebook and Twitter and 11 at 11 on TV on WPXI tonight. So, Darius, uh, just great for a change to have a good result to a story like this. The baby is found. Thank yeah. goodness. And as rare as these cases are where babies, newborns are taken out of hospitals, this is, of course, a great story to tell tonight that baby Bryce was found uh, just, what, within the last half hour ago. So this is this is wonderful news for his and family. She, the woman there being interviewed, I can't wait to hear what she has to say. And as you mentioned, Darius, just learn more about this story. Uh, such a sad few hours for the family desperation, but thank goodness the baby's found. Yeah, stay with us. We're going to have more for you tonight at 10 and 11 o'clock. We'll see you then. Good, Good night. night.